Are you looking for a new job? Are you hiring but can't find diverse, talented candidates? Then we have something that can help, our job board. Head on over to revisionpath.com forward slash jobs to browse listings or to place your own. This week on the job board, Uber is looking for a product designer. This is a remote position for those in San Francisco, Seattle, or the Pacific time zone, though they are also looking for people in New York City. Northern Kentucky University is looking for a visual communication design lecturer in Highland Heights, Kentucky. And OwnUp is looking for a product designer. This is a remote position. For just $99, we will feature your listing on our job board for 30 days and help spread the word about it to our audience of listeners. We also offer an annual job board subscription for companies and organizations. Make sure to head over to revisionpath.com forward slash jobs for more information on these listings and others. Apply today and tell me you heard about the job through Revision Path. Get started with us and expand your job search today. Revisionpath.com forward slash jobs. You're listening to the Revision Path podcast, a weekly showcase of the world's black graphic designers, web designers, and web developers. Through in-depth interviews, you'll learn about their work, their goals, and what inspires them as creative individuals. Here's your host, Maurice Cherry. Hello, everybody, and welcome to Revision Path. Thank you so much for tuning in. I'm your host, Maurice Cherry. This week, I'm talking with Russell Toynes. Russell is a design educator and entrepreneur and the founder and creative director at Studio Zoe in Austin, Texas. Let's start the show. All right. So tell us who you are and what you do. Uh, my name is Russell Toynes, and I am the creative director at, and owner at Studio Zoe. I'm also a design educator. I teach portfolio design at Austin Community College, and I am a core member of AAGD, which is African American Graphic Designers. And I'm a mentor to a lot of either previous students or, or folks that wish they were a student of mine. Nice. I'm also a dad and a husband, but those things, um, those are all day, every day. Um, <laughs> and those are the, some of the best things that I do. Yeah. <laughs> we'll, we'll see. Well, well, you should ask them. <laughs> How's 2022 been going so far? 2022 has been good. We're actually really excited. 2021 was a banner year for us. And 2022 is exactly the same. Our books are full and the work just keeps coming in and uh, we have a good team. We had a little bit of a, an upset in 2021 where we had a, some folks get, uh, uh, what's that bug that they caught? The great resignation. <laughs> oh, <laughs> <laughs> Some of them got some of that, you know, and so that left us in a little bit of bind. So we had two new team members start in January and so we're still training them. So it's a, it's a little challenging with that, with some new team members, but 2022 is starting out great for us. Is there anything uh, in particular that you really want to try to accomplish this year? You know, really, uh, we have a good processes, but I always want to get right and tight, right? So I really, really am looking at how do we streamline our business? My goal, well, with the pandemic, we're really, before pandemic, we had a studio on East 6th Street and it was great. We were there for like three or four years. And we just moved into a new place. We did a $10,000 build out. We moved into a new place on South Lamar mm. on February 17th on 2020. And then March 17th, 2020, we uh, said to everybody, Hey, so this thing's going on. We're going to send you home. You're going to work from home and we'll check in like every week or two and we'll figure out when we're going to come back. We were mm -hmm. really naive, right? We just didn't know. <laughs> we, so you know, and I was scared and, and uh, we have a little blog on our website. And so I just wrote a blog of just like kind of a cathartic owning a being a small business owner and uh, during a pandemic is fucking scary. And so, you know, like I wrote this kind of blog post just kind of talking about like my biggest thing was just thinking about not only do I have to keep food on my table, but I got to keep food on five other people's tables also, you know, mm -hmm. and so not knowing what that was going to look like was really scary. But what I realized was when we were in the studio, we were really kind of locally focused, right? We did some state, some things outside of Austin, or lots of things outside of Austin, but some, lots of things in other states, Oregon and 
Pennsylvania and Arizona and places like that. But we were really kind of just thinking, oh, we're, we're Austin, we're Texas. When we went remote, all of a sudden opportunities just started just coming in different directions. And now we really see ourselves as global. We have done work in Singapore. We have done mm-hmm. work all over the United States. We have partners all over the world. So really thinking about, and we just wrapped up a project in Canada, just thinking about what we have done in the last year. It's amazing that when we opened our minds up to thinking beyond our local borders, what we've accomplished. And so really 2022 is just about how do we keep this momentum? How do we move forward and continue to have a global presence? That's really good to hear. I mean, the pandemic, you know, it's changed business for so many people. I mean, I've talked to several studio owners, big and small, that have all had to really adjust because they weren't able to come together physically in an office like they did before. I mean, for the team, was it a big shift to kind of make that change? Yes. So, you know, we have team members of various ages. So we have seven team members. uh, So seven in total. So me and my wife, and then we have five other team members. And they're all employees of ours, but we call them team members because I don't like the idea of people being an employee. So they're all in different places in life. Some have families, some are single, some have partners. And so obviously the pandemic hit everybody. So if you're Mm. a family person and you have a spouse at home and children, they're all affected. And so That changed a lot for our team member in particular who who has kids. You know, it's just how do you work when his escape kind of sort of was, you know, getting in the car, driving to the studio, spending six to eight hours there and driving back and having that decompression time and that transitional period. And now it's get up, feed, clothe, put him in front of whatever Zoom classes they have, then get in front of his work Zoom and... Mm -hmm do work. And then their kids, they're from various ages. And so that was the biggest challenge. Our big thing was we wanted to focus on their mental health. We wanted to make sure that they had the freedom to take whatever time they needed just to process what the hell was going on. Because for all of us, we just didn't know. It was scary especially in the very beginning when we just didn't know what it was, but people were getting sick and people were dying. As time went on, the adaptations changed, right? It went from, okay, let me just figure out just how to keep people, my team healthy and somewhat productive to this. Okay. We can't talk about going back. We got to talk about moving forward. Mm -hmm. And so it was like, what do you need to be effective? You know, what do you need to be efficient. So the team came back to the studio. We gave them their desk, their sit-stand desk. Then we got everybody. We you know, Our designers have desktops. Actually, almost everybody had desktops. And so we we're like, look, we can't say you work remote, but then basically chain you to a desk. So we got everybody all new laptops. And we were like, look, we don't know what this is going to look like, but you have the freedom to work from wherever you're at. So if you want to travel somewhere, you can work from there. As long as you're able to be productive, work however you want to. And so for us, we really just had to figure out what was going to work now that we were in the long haul for this. So really, it was just changing our work model. So changing it from in the studio to being remote, but then also from a kind of a clock in clock out, like you had in the studio where people come in and they expect to be in at nine, expect to stay till five and had a good kind of culture there where now it's like, we have to go to dentist, we have to get our car inspected, we have to Mm -hmm. do all things while being at home. So we switched to this get it done model where it's like, you know what you need to do Monday, Wednesday, Friday, first thing in the morning, we talk about what we need to do. And then you just go do it however you're going to get it done. So if you want to take out the middle of the day to hang out with the kids, cool. You know, you know what needs to be done when it needs to be done. I don't need to babysit you. And so that's worked out really, really well, both for my wife and I, Elizabeth, because sometimes we're just not feeling (laughs) like sitting in front of a desk. And so we can, you know, sit with our laptop. And plus, you know, we can do a lot of our work via our phone if we're just calling or setting up meetings or reviewing work. So for us, this whole get it done model has really helped us all tackle life's responsibilities along with work responsibilities. I mean, it sounds like you and the team are really able to kind of make a agile shift pretty quickly. Do you think that was just because of 
like your tight knit nature of the team? Like, what do you really attribute to that? I had, I was a creative director, uh, sorry, I was art director at Dell for five and a half years. And I learned quite a bit of what to do and what not to do. And so very, very quickly, I knew that I wanted everything that we did to be cloud-based. And so I didn't want the opportunity for someone to have anything on their local drive that we needed or for a laptop to get stolen and work that I had paid for over months for them to do got lost. So we were already very equipped to work remotely because everything was already backed up to the cloud constantly through Google File Stream. And we had been using all the Google Suites. So everything from the calendars to email to everything. So we were already well equipped to kind of just work from devices, whether that be iPads, phones, or or computers or something like that. I think being that we're a small team and it, so it was seven of us, I think that allowed us to be nimble. And we've always prided ourselves on being nimble and being able to kind of fail quickly. So we'll try something. If it doesn't work, let's adapt. But honestly, I just I attribute it to having a just a damn good team who really has a lot of faith in Elizabeth and I to just guide them and they'll follow us in whatever direction we we ask them to. And we have have an open door policy. We ask people like there's no hierarchy other than the fact that I I'm responsible for making sure they get paid and everything. Everyone has the opportunity to make a suggestion. Everybody has the opportunity to talk to me or Elizabeth and say, hey, you know, this isn't working or this could be better or I am dealing with something. And, and you know, unfortunately, during the pandemic, things happen, you know, people die, maybe it's pandemic related, maybe it's not, you know, and we have to be adaptive to that. And so we can't just sit there and go, well, we're running a business here. Sorry. You know, it's like, no, we'll figure it out. We'll make it work. And we just have a a killer team that just everybody has everybody's back. So it really has helped us, you know, move and and shift and be nimble during this time of of uncertainty. Now you talked about going from being more locally focused with your client base to now having this kind of global reach What are like the best types of clients for you to work with? So we work with architects, interior designers and developers and business owners. We work with everybody, but those are like the best. Our ideal client, we don't call our clients clients. We call them partners because this is a partnership. We have to work together. I don't work for anybody. And so we are working together to meet a goal and to create an experience. And so for us, you know, we love working with interior designers because A, they know the budget and they're realistic. <laughs> <laughs> they're not developers who have a stake in how much money the project makes. And they're not designers who are like, oh, I think I know how to design, you know, a sign or an installation and they have no idea. So when we work with You know, and architects are good, but architects always hire interior designers and interior designers love us and we love them. So they have a vision. We bring their visions either to life or we just, they say, this is an area that we don't know what to do, but that's where we call you. And Mm so interior designers are great. So we work with lots of different agencies that have uh, wonderful, talented uh, interior designers who rely on us to do what we do well. And the crazy thing is, is maybe it's kind of the same in design. I don't know, but there's a lot of turnover, right? I don't know if it's just like they go to a place, they're there for a year and then they want to just go to somewhere else or they move or whatever. So kind of like uh, pollinating, right? Like we make great relationships with one studio and then five of their interior designers over the course of a year or two go to five different other places. And then mm-hmm. those five other places call us too. And next thing you know, we got 15, <laughs> 20 interior design agencies all around the United States and whatnot that are calling us for project after project. So I love him. <laughs> yeah. I like that kind of like spread effect like that. I mean, I think, you know, you kind of mentioned the great resignation a couple of times now. It's interesting how, because the pandemic has forced a lot of people to now work from home or work from remote locations that a lot of companies before are just having to open themselves up to talent from a lot of other places. And so I think that can be both good and bad. Of course, for the company, I could see the downside of it because now that they're working with employees from other states, they've got to think about like, well, can we legally hire people in the state? And what does that mean? Exactly. Like, you know, that's my wife. Should we, so we, we had a team member in Atlanta. And 
she jumped through so many hoops with the comptroller there in Atlanta to just get this person to where we can offer them insurance and, and everything else. Yeah, it's a huge undertaking when you bring on somebody outside of your state and it's a new state that you haven't been in already. Yeah. And then for the worker, it can be kind of easy because now so many gigs that before were just landlocked to a certain city. Now you can work from everywhere. Like I've been working, personally, I've been working remotely since 2009. And like you, like when I had, like I had a studio for nine years from 2009 to 2017. And like we did some work locally. We did a lot of national work, some international work. But I'd say for the past like two years now, on and off kind of for the past two years, I've mostly been working internationally. Like it's worked out that I can now take my skills and I can work in Amsterdam. I can work in Paris, which is where my current job is is headquartered at. So so how do you deal with the time difference? Not well. I was going to say, <laughs> I went to Hawaii. I went to Hawaii in January and I didn't think that was going to mess me up, but boy, did it. <laughs> Not well. I mean, so when I worked for the the company in Amsterdam, like it was a, I think it was a six hour time difference, five to six hour time difference. Cause you know, daylight savings time eventually creeps in, but it was rough. Cause like by the time I'd start in the morning, it would be in the afternoon there. There would be sometimes I would have to be up at like 4 a.m. for a meeting. And thank God they were not anal about having the camera on with anything. So I could just like (laughs) be halfway in bed on Zoom. Like, yeah, yeah, you know, whatever. For the current job, it's kind of not that bad because we're split. Like where my time zone is, Eastern time zone is sort of split between where the company is. So we're between San Francisco and Paris. So in the morning, I work with the Europeans, like my boss is in London. And then in the afternoon, I'm working with more of the creative team that's here in the U.S. that are like in California. So my day is kind of split in that way. We do a lot, like a lot of async communication just to kind of like pass the baton back and forth. But it's, you know, it can be brutal sometimes. Like sometimes I am working a 12 hour day from like five to five, sometimes, not all the time, but sometimes it happens. And it's, it's a lot. (laughs) That's our goal. That's our goal is my wife and I, you know, I have a 20 year old daughter. And so she's very much into living her own life. And Mm -hmm. that's something I've been trying to adjust to. (laughs) But we have aspirations to basically be kind of digital nomads and I'll really set up our team to where we can, you know, we have aspirations to make either a home or a temporary home in Portugal. And mm. so it's the idea of like, how do we do this? How do we, what would it look like? What time would we get up? What time would we be on? What time would we be off? You know, and really just kind of thinking about that. And we haven't really put it to test. The pandemic hasn't really given us the comfort that we want to travel. Hawaii, like I mentioned, they had a really good COVID response. So, you know, Mm -hmm. you have to have, you know, your vaccination, you have to have a 72 hour negative COVID test. You got to have everything right and tight or they won't even let you on the island. And so we felt comfortable with that was a trip we've been planning since 2019 for my daughter's graduation. So Mm -hmm. we did go to Florida uh, during Delta. And so we're big Disney fans for the service and the attention to detail. And so we go to Disney World as much as possible. And we went in 2020 and, or 2021, August. Mm-hmm. And that was not a vacation. <laughs> that, was not, <laughs> that was like, like, you know, going to like a neighborhood, you know, you don't want to be in. <laughs> uh-huh. It was like that. It was just head was on the swivel everybody you know i mean disney did a good job but you know people do what people do and so you know people weren't wearing their mask right people were just being too close and all that but it was really dead there it really wasn't the crowds were nothing like they would normally be so you know we made the best of the trip but now we're trying to get back to the swing of things and we want to travel more and see you know what it's like to work in foreign places and make that adjustment. So I envy you. I might have to call you up and get some tips, you know, on how to adjust with jet lag. Yeah, I do a lot of like, it's a lot of async communication. It's a lot of scheduled emails. It's a lot of, at least for me, and I don't know if this is probably just like a general tactic, but I do a lot of managing up. So I have a manager, but then I also manage someone. So like for my, my manager, I do a lot of, you know, I give regular, regular updates, like I just did this. This is what I'm working on now. Cause we may only get like 
our schedules only overlap for 30 minutes a day. So we don't have a ton of time to really like get together and talk. So I'm always letting him know, like, this is what I have to do. This is what I'm working on. This is where I have a blocker or something like that. And so then he can work on those things when I'm not at work. And it's sort of like is kind of passing the baton. I would say also the benefit is that he and I have worked together at two other companies now. So we know how to work together well, as opposed to kind of having to figure that out with someone new. And that's exactly like, that's what you were asking. You know, how did we, you know, make this adjustment? Our team consists of, uh, like I said, five additional to me and my wife. And so three of those five, so the two new ones are the newest, right? Mm -hmm. But three of those five have been with us for years. One of them was a previous student of mine. He's been with us the longest. He's been with us for five years now. And when you work with somebody that close, like, you know, there's a trust there, but also there's just this like ability to understand what needs to be done. And there's not a lot of conversation necessary. And so that's why it's always hard for us when we, someone decides they want to leave and go to something else is just the the onboarding time's a headache, but there's a lot of just energy and, and gaining of trust and all that, that has to be built with somebody brand new that you can't do in your typical onboarding, you know, window of 60 to 90 days or something like that. Yeah. And I mean, with this particular thing, and I, I mean, I'm not, hopefully I'm not telling too much of my business by saying this, but like he and I, like we started working together in 2017 at one startup, and then he left and then a couple, I think maybe like a couple of months later, they eliminated our entire department at the first place we worked at. But then he got a job at another startup and was like, do you want to work here? And I didn't have a job. So I was like, sure, let's do it. (laughs) And then he left there to another startup, which is where he's at now. And then was like, yeah, we're, I need help. And I want to do these things. Do you want a job? I'm like, sure. So for him, I mean, it's just like, come on with me and, and make these things happen. But also has increased my salary tremendously. There so for, <laughs> for that, go. I am very thankful. <laughs> makes dollars and cents, huh? Exactly. Yeah. So just to kind of, you know, switch gears a little bit, you know, we talked a lot about Studio Zoe, but let's focus on on you because you're the subject, of course, of this interview. Like, tell me a bit about like where you grew up. So I grew up in Austin, Texas. I'm okay. one of the few like Austinites that uh, are OG, you know, that, uh, you know, these people that came in from outside or from California. So I've seen Austin change tremendously over the last 38 years. Mm -hmm. I was born in Houston and we uh, moved here as a kid. I remember the ride here, but yeah, I've, I've grown up in Austin and South Austin in particular and still live in South Austin. And I have a love hate with the city, right? Because this is Mm. my city. And I say that because I've uh, spent a long time more recently just trying to retrace my roots. And you know, that can be challenging for us. And so realizing my entire family is from Austin. You know, my dad was born here in Austin. My great, great, great grandfather was born in Austin. And crazy thing was just recently, a random phone call came to the studio, right? This woman's like, I'm cleaning up my property and there's a headstone with toys on it. Whoa. On my property. And she was like, I don't think anybody's buried here, but this headstone's here. And it's my great grandfather's headstone. And so he he has a headstone in Evergreen Cemetery. So I'm like, what is this about? And so, but we've always joked because the headstone in in Evergreen Cemetery is incorrect. It has like, it makes him 150 years old when he was dead. So whoever made that one, the numbers are wrong, but this one had the correct numbers with the wrong spelling of his first name. And so it was just all like, I don't know the story behind this. So, um, but just, you know, to kind of reiterate, like my family has been here and everything about my family is Austin and East Austin in particular. Mm-hmm. And so it's hard for me to see East Austin different. It's hard yeah. for me to see it where I don't know what our our, pop, our black population is, but it was 8%, I think, at its highest. And it's like mm-hmm. three maybe now. I don't know. But it's, it's not what it used to be. And the communities now are so transient. It's starting to feel a little bit like New York where you just don't know who's going to be here for how long. So it's been sad for me to kind of accept what's happening to Austin. And I think it's also been hard for me to accept that maybe this isn't my forever place. Even though Mm -hmm. my family has been here forever, 
just may not be my forever place. Yeah, I think that's something a lot of people are realizing, particularly over the the past two years, not just because of the pandemic, but because of gentrification, inflation, everything is more expensive. Like Atlanta is very much a transient city like that as well. Like I'm originally from Alabama, but I've been in Atlanta now for 23 years. I think I came in 99. So I've been here for about 23 years now. And even seeing how much Atlanta has changed when I came as a teenager to now being like a full grown ass man and seeing how things have changed, even just different parts of the city. Like I remember when I first got here, I'd say maybe I was a junior in college. My first apartment was like $600 a month in Buckhead. (laughs) That's impossible now. And then I stayed in another place in Buckhead. It was a two bedroom. One room was my office. One was my bedroom. And it was right off of Peachtree Street, like in Buckhead proper for like $750 a month or something like that. Now those are like $2.5 million Mm -hmm. condos. Like it's wild seeing how the city has has kind of changed over the years. So I totally get what you mean. Yeah, it's a hard pill to swallow. And, you know, and then also to see who gets pushed out and who comes in, right? Mm-hmm. Those are, you know, mm-hmm. and it's not like everybody's just winning, right? <laughs> yeah. So it's hard. It's hard. Like, especially here, because Atlanta, of course, has a, a reputation of being a city that's really out. It's really sort of, there's a lot of prosperous Black people here, a lot of affluent Black people here, which is true. I totally don't think I would have been able to accomplish what I've been able to accomplish entrepreneurship-wise in any other city but Atlanta, because I had a lot of support from the Black community here. But yeah, like rents are are getting more and more expensive. Everything is just more expensive. Like it's tough to move here now and start out fresh than it than you could maybe even like ten years ago, because things are just everything is just changing. Yeah, I love Atlanta. Me and my wife, we have friends and uh, we don't have any family, but we we would like to think of them as family. But we have a lot of people that we know in Atlanta, and we love going there and. It's just a huge, huge city. Like people think Austin, they think, oh, it's such a cool city. It's a small, when you're talking about footprint wise, Mm -hmm. the city is small. Yeah. And Atlanta, you got like seven lane highways and every <laughs> and I don't even know why you have a speed limit. Let's be honest, right? Like That's true. That's true. Everybody, even the police, man, they're they're 80 on the highway and it says 65, 55. You're like, you can't even legally go this slow. Yeah. But it's, yeah, it's a I love and I love what y'all have done, unlike Austin, right? Like what y'all have done with like Pont City Market, how mm-hmm. you took an old building and instead of tearing it down like they would do in Austin, you, you know, you utilized it and I you know they're not at all affordable in any way, but at least to uh, utilize it for housing mm-hmm. and a development instead of just tearing it down and, and creating something brand new, which is Austin's mode of operations here yeah i mean we have a, a couple of places like that in atlanta there's there there's a uh, croak street market there's a couple other places probably further outside of the perimeter but atlanta is good for tearing shit down too and just starting a new like i tell people because i used to work in the tourism industry here and i tell people like atlanta's a city that every seven years tries to find a new identity like it tries to find like what's the new thing that we can latch on to and really make our thing because I was working in the tourism industry from 2005 to 2007. And so during that time, Hurricane Katrina happened. But when I first started in 2005, like Atlanta was really trying to sort of distinguish itself from say Orlando or Vegas or New York, because people liked to come to Atlanta, but the reasons that they liked to come to Atlanta were not how can I put this? Family friendly reasons <laughs> for wanting to go. <laughs> like they'll go to Orlando because of Disney World. They'll go to New York City because of the culture. But like there was no distinguishing thing that people would come to Atlanta for, at least not ones that you would put on a tourism pamphlet. Like other than the world of Coke and the aquarium. <laughs> look, we didn't even have the aquarium then. This really? was pre the aquarium. Yeah, I was at the groundbreaking for the aquarium. But this was even before then. All we had was like World of Coke. We had the zoo and like Turner Field. Yeah. That's about it. Like there's not a lot of places like really people came to Atlanta back then because one, it sort of carried over this reputation of being a party city from like the 90s. But you've got hip hop. You've got all kinds of entertainment. you got clubs like 
that's why people came to Atlanta to have fun, to like have a good time. But none of those things, like they're not going to put strippers on a pamphlet and have that at the airport. Like that's not, <laughs> is that a reason people would come? Sure. But that's not one that like the Atlanta Convention and Visitors Bureau would get behind because they're if trying Vegas to get. can do it. <laughs> Well, but see, they're trying to get like multi-million dollar shows to come here. And we had a huge show pull out in 2005 called Home Builders. Like something happened with like somebody said the wrong thing to somebody and like this million dollar show pulled out of Atlanta. And then it was another big show. T.D. Jakes, the t- evangelist, the preacher. Yeah. yeah. He used to do this big thing called Mega Fest, and he would bring it to Atlanta. And it was basically like a two week I don't know, mega fest. I mean, it had carnival rides, it had speakers and panels and all this sort of stuff. And they pulled out as well. Wow. And so Atlanta was like, well, we don't have any reason for people to come here. Cause the other thing was these conventions would all be downtown and downtown is a ghost town after five o'clock. Like yes, pe- yes. people commute downtown and then they leave. And there's the only thing that's really downtown at night are homeless folks. And so because of that, like conventions didn't feel like they wanted to have people down there because they were getting like accosted by people on the street and they didn't feel it was safe and everything. And so one of the things that happened was the aquarium opened, but then Hurricane Katrina happened and a lot of conventions had to kind of relocate to Atlanta. And so we sort of had a big boom there for a while, but then that died out as New Orleans tried to rebuild and, you know, conventions went back there. So then the the Georgia Tourism Department basically worked with the state to get all these tax benefits for movies and television shows and studios and stuff to shoot here. So like now that's the big thing that Atlanta is for. Atlanta is like, quote unquote, black Hollywood because I love it. Yeah. you have so many movies and shows and things that are here that people come and, and shoot for. I mean, it's rare now. Well, it used to be rare back then, but now it's super common to like watch a movie and be like, oh yeah, that's in Atlanta. Like I'll watch Black Panther, that that scene at the mm-hmm. museum. I used to work that I used to work at that museum selling tickets. Like that's awesome. That's awesome. <laughs> so I so I look at stuff and be like, okay, that's but even now that's starting to die off because politics, now politicians here have certain views and then that goes against what the companies are here that are giving them money. Like it's a whole Atlanta's complicated, man. Like, really, it's Georgia, but, like, Atlanta itself is a, a complicated blue dot in a very red state. That is, yeah, that is a whole message right there, exactly. <laughs> I mean, <laughs> we've even talked about moving to Atlanta, and they were like, but it's in Georgia. You know, yeah. and I'm in Texas, so I can't really say anything, because <laughs> <laughs> both states are sitting in the same spot, but just like Atlanta, Austin is that that blueberry in the tomato soup. Um, yeah. But unfortunately, you know, the, like you said, the politics of both states have gotten a bad reputation. Mm-hmm. I mean, like, if you're in Atlanta, it's so funny. It's uh, I remember this from, uh, oh, I know what the show is. It was Sex in the City. And there's like this episode of Sex in the City where Carrie and Miranda are like double dating these guys. And one of the guys says something about how he's never left New York. And Miranda's like, oh, he's a weirdo if he's never left New York. There's people here that have moved to Atlanta and have never left Atlanta. They've stayed right in the perimeter or right inside the metropolitan area because anything outside of here is deliverance. Like it's a totally (laughs) it's a totally different thing. If you go an hour in any direction from the center of Atlanta, like good luck. Yeah, it is strange also. But the thing is, y'all can travel for three or four hours, maybe not safely, but you can travel for three or four hours and be in a whole other state. You know, with us, it takes eight hours to get to El Paso. (laughs) Oh, yeah, that's true. (laughs) It's like, you know, you want to get to the coast. That's a three hour trip. You want to get to Dallas. That's a three and a half hour trip with no traffic. And so, you know, Houston, same thing, three hours. And so everything just takes a long time and you're still in the damn state. Yeah. So being from Austin and and growing up there, like, were you exposed to a lot of design and everything growing up? Short answer, no. (laughs) Mm. You know, for me, designer was exclusive to jeans and fragrance. (laughs) (laughs) I didn't know, you know, no one ever told me. I think this just happens to being an 80s kid, you know, having Someone sit down and point to you in the library, you know, like you see that crappy poster, somebody designed that. See mm-hmm. this book, someone designed it. No one ever did that, right? So you you really only knew the jobs that you saw people do, you know? So mm-hmm. 
My dad worked in restaurants and then basically did sales for Circuit City. That's dating, right? (laughs) uh, My mom has always been in insurance. And then pretty much every single person I knew either worked for like the post office or for some insurance company or had military history or just worked like some office, rando office job. So no one ever like sat down with me ever and said, you know, you could be this. I was talking to my wife and I was like, you know, the first time I ever like met somebody, you know, like at a career fair or something. And then that person was like, this is what I do. And then I said, I want to do that. The very first time that happened, I think I was in like fourth grade and it was a lobbyist. And I was like, I want to do what they do. (laughs) I have no idea what was compelling about being a lobbyist. (laughs) but I think it was the idea of convincing people. Right. And so, Mm -hmm. uh, no, no one ever told me. So design wasn't ever presented to me. And it wasn't until I realized in, when I you know, went to school that design is problem solving. And that's all I have ever done as a kid is I mm-hmm. was that kid that woke up at five o'clock in the morning with a problem, right? With a problem that I manifested in my dreams and I had to find a solution. So I was constantly taking things apart, reimagining things, putting things together, just making up shit for myself to do. And I was always solving problems. I've always been a natural leader too. I just managed to convince people to follow me in some direction. And thankfully, I never started a cult. But it probably <laughs> wouldn't have been too hard for me. But I always you know, had the knack of kind of being a loner, but having no problem getting followers, but never Mm -hmm. wanted to be a follower. So I was, you know, I was that kid that was like cool with everybody, but really was kind of a loner in a way. Like everyone knew me. I had lots of friends, but I only let certain people in. So as a natural problem solver, I just kind of found myself into lots of things, but no one ever gave me like the design word to call it. And it wasn't until My older brother graduated from school, uh, from ACC, also with a design degree and a degree in politics that I even understood that designers had software and they did things. And it just wasn't like, I don't know, I just like it wasn't a word or it wasn't painter, you know. Mm -hmm. So you went to, to Austin Community College and you studied design and visual communications. Like, how was that experience? Like a lot of black designers, I had a very unconventional journey into design. So as I mentioned, I didn't know what design was. So my original like entrepreneur efforts started when I was catching shoplifters for four years. And then my daughter was born and she needed round the clock care at home. So me and my wife had to decide like, who's going to stay home and take care of her and who's going to go to work. And she had the better benefits. So it was like, okay, I'll stay at home and take care of her. Well, you know, money still needs to be had. And so I always had aspirations to be a film director. So I started writing little films and things like that, but that doesn't pay. But I had the knowledge and understanding to cut video. And so I started out just like cutting people's home videos, like taking people's crappy home videos and removing all the stuff where mom left it on the table, recording nothing and all that. Mm -hmm. And just started doing that. And that, you know, led down to a very strange path to me working with lots of people, one being Vanilla Ice. And what? Just, yeah, yeah, random. <laughs> so, <laughs> yeah, I, I did a really, really crappy like music video for a friend. I did it for six dollars, too. That's just tells you how tight wow. things were back then. <laughs> <laughs> and so and then a promoter for Vanilla Ice saw it. I I'm embarrassed to say that, but saw it. And then they called me up and they're like, we have a whole bunch of raw footage from a concert in like 99 or 2000. They're like, can you cut it and put it to DVD? And I was like, wow. And so that kind of got things started. So that was like a, that got me out of doing the, the home videos. And then that's when people are like, Oh, can you do a music video for me? Can you do that? And I ended up working on a big project for text dot, um, a training video for them. And like I saw the future of me like being in this film video game, but I had no education. I had no knowledge. I didn't know anything about anything. I was just doing whatever, you know, how it worked and it worked okay. But then in 2006, I guess it was 2005, like, you know, I was working with a rapper and they were less than honest with the people who were giving them money. And then basically 
I always tried to operate with contracts and basically he was trying to get out of the contract and made it quite dramatic. I'll spare you the details, <laughs> <laughs> but let's just say that I had to act less than professional because he was acting less than professional. And you know, and you know, you got don't it, got it. No, 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 I know what you mean. You get grown. Yeah. <laughs> <And> so <laughs> I was just like, I'm done with this shit. I'm done with this shit. And I just woke up January 1st, 2006. And I was like, I'm a designer. <laughs> That's it. That's it. I just put that shit out in the universe, right? And so, so my brother, my older brother gave me a bootleg copy of CS2. And I just started working in Illustrator. And I had already been designing like DVD covers and things like that for the stuff that I had been doing, but I didn't know anything about it. And so, but what was crazy was like I said, I've never had a problem getting people to kind of follow me. Mm-hmm. I just like I just told the world I was a designer and the world just said, OK, <laughs> you know, and the world just like, so can you do this for me? Can you do this for me? And so like I had like a, a nice little nest of construction people and concrete people who were just like they didn't know anything about anything, but they could just pay me and uh, they get their carbonless forms and business cards and mailers and their trucks with vinyl on it and things like that. And I was doing the worst design on the planet and I <laughs> it was awful, but it was paying barely any of the bills I had. And I was just, I was making it each day, but you know, I thought I was balling too. I got myself a little, this tells you the time too. I got myself a little one room office on Burnett road in, in kind of central Austin mm-hmm. for $250 a month. Right? That's all it cost. Yeah. Wow. <laughs> so you know, I thought I was balling. I was like, I got an office and this and this. I didn't need the office. I could have worked from home. But this was just my excuse to, to kind of give myself the tools to feel like I have arrived. And then I started mentoring young people at LBJ. And I had gone to LBJ Science Academy at the time. Um, it, it was called Science Academy at the time. Now it's called Liberal Arts and Science Academy. But I started mentoring young people there. And they were learning Illustrator, Photoshop, InDesign all in one semester. And I was like, these damn kids are going to take my job. I got to get more education. Yeah. So I went to ACC and I was 27 years old. I had a five-year-old daughter at the time. I was divorced. And I just saw that I had a lot of passion. I had a lot of drive, but I had no education. And this kind of just winging it was proving not reasonable. You know, I wasn't going to be able to to sustain myself if I wanted to make a life for myself um, mm-hmm. at all in design. So I went to school and that was the best damn decision I ever made in my life. So after you went to school and you graduated, like what was kind of your early career like? Like you sort of mentioned earlier, you had worked for Dell for quite a number of years. You know, I still freelanced while I was in school and I very much have always been a person to take advantage of every single opportunity. And I meet somebody and I'm like, if I want to work with them, I'm going to make them work with me. I just have the ability to just manifest a lot of what I I want. And so for me, you know, I stayed very involved in design and design community and everything. And I had a great, great portfolio professor who later became a mentor, Owen Hammonds. And oh, yeah. Still was a, yeah, still is a friend of mine. Still, I mean, I call him my mentor. He says we're just friends, but I still see him <laughs> as, a, as, a, as a huge, huge influence in me. He, I attribute almost all of my success to him. And it was an honor to have him in my wedding. It was an honor to, to have him in my life um, and to call him a friend. And we're both very, very busy. But whenever we get on the phone with each other or see each other, it's just an honor. So, But yeah, he really kind of took me under his wing. He was my portfolio professor at ACC. And he just, you know, he saw like this hustler in me and he's like, this dude's going to do it. And he just kind of plugged me in and just stayed on me and never, never bullshitted me, never gassed me up, like always pushed me to be better. And so right out of school, I called, I'm sure you have them in Atlanta. I'm sure you've heard of them, like various talent headhunters, right? Like a Quint or yeah. liaison resources or the creative group and all of them. So Aquint had come to one of our classes and kind of talked about like they find jobs for creatives and all this stuff like that. So I just graduated. I mean, literally like the day we finished class. So I hadn't even graduated yet. Uh, just the class was done. I just like was on in the car driving. I just called them up and I was like, hey, heard you can get me a job. And they were like, send me your portfolio. <laughs> and then like the next day they like called me in they're like, Hey, let's talk. And they're like, we have these jobs. And so I started interviewing 
for people. And I interviewed Adele and, you know, it took him a little bit of time to see, see my magic. <laughs> but, <laughs> you know, after four months, basically interviewing with them, like two or three times I interviewed with them for like lunches and all this stuff. And I was like, you like me, I like you, let's do this, right? It's like mm-hmm. dating. I got put on at Dell and I started out as a designer and, you know, worked my way up to senior designer, art director, senior art director. And really I tell people like, I got my degree in, in visual communications at ACC, but I got my master's in the business of design at Dell. I had an amazing creative director, Tommy Lynn, who really, really, really taught me a lot, gave me a lot of autonomy, really trusted me. Um, and I still see him as a friend and a mentor even now. And we've both been gone from Dell for many years, but I learned the business of design. I understood how to, to, to handle clients, how to, to give them the level of service that brings them back. And I know it sounds weird because I was on the brand team. So we only answered to the brand. We developed the brand, we evolved the brand, but we had internal clients who used our team to create resources that promoted Dell's brand. So it Mm -hmm. would be a uh, corporate responsibility team. It be. It really wasn't marketing. It wasn't. We didn't do anything about selling product. It was about selling the brand as a whole. And so, having both Owen Hammonds having the education helped me land Dell. But Dell helped me really take this entrepreneurial energy that I've always kind of possessed and really, really hone it into where my next step was. Was and I didn't really realize that I want to go back to being an entrepreneur, but they set me up tremendously and gave me a fat paycheck to learn over the course of five and a half years. So I, I'm not going to complain about that. Yeah, there you go. I mean, when you had sort of your time there working at Dell and learning about kind of the business of design, was that the impetus for you to start your own studio? No, honestly, no. Like I saw like myself, like everybody else, right? You go from one place, you do three to five years, then you go to another place. And honestly, I didn't see myself going back into entrepreneurship because I had never had like a nine to five salary with and benefits and all that. I had basically worked an hourly job until my daughter was born and then basically just like hustled in the worst way possible to, to make crumbs doing video and design and whatnot. So when somebody was like, here, here's a paycheck and here's some benefits and here's a lifestyle you've never had. Like, I just figured this is it, right? Like this is, I've just landed the jackpot. But then over five and a half years, you start to realize like there is a ceiling. There's, and it depends on who your manager is. It depends on who your executive is. And you start realizing, you know, people start leaving and you start wondering, am I the last ship? Sorry, am I the last rat on a sinking a sinking ship? And so all my team that I had been with over the five and a half years, only one other person was with me. And so, you know, we had watched like 20 people over the course of time come in and out that it was just like, okay, the writing's in the wall. You either going to be a lifer here or you got to find something else. It was really my wife who said, you know, like she's always been my greatest supporter. And I had talked about owning a business and her father had sold his business and was kind of always envious of design and wanted to do something with me. And so I said, look, you know, we'll do something, but we'll do it on my terms. And he was like, yeah, yeah, yeah. And so after basically I tried to bluff my executive at Dell to give me, you know, more money and uh, to give me a promotion. Basically, I was trying to bluff and be like, well, I'm going to have to go find something else. And they're like, good luck. <laughs> <laughs> so I was like, look, I got to, you know, I just can't blow smoke. I got to do this. And so I left on like uh, September 7th. And I thought I was going to take like the whole month of September off and like, you know, like two weeks later, I started the laying the groundwork for Studio Zo. With my with my father in law in mind to be my partner, long story short, we realized quickly we cannot work together. My wife realized that before we realized, that. <laughs> and my wife was like, "Look, if because we were about to get married, she's like, if we're gonna get married. We can't have this. Like, I gotta have a relationship with my father. I gotta have a relationship with my husband. Mm-hmm. Y'all can't be at each other's throat. We had very different mindsets of 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 what this business was gonna be. So." We uh, had a a negotiation with him, had a conversation, and we said, it's time for you to retire. Go and do your own thing. And and he's he's a restless person anyway. So he had a software business. He's now able to dedicate himself to that. And so he was with us for about the first seven months of Studio Zoe. Okay. 
I mean, I guess he didn't want it to be that much of a, a family business, you know. He really wanted that. He only has girls. So he like really wanted like this family business with a son-in-law and all this stuff like that. And uh-huh. um, I think he had like this idea, but in his head that he really wanted. But yeah, now it's just me and my wife and, and it's good. You know, we have the same interests, both financially and the goal of the business. So we are in sync where if you have different people who have different lifestyles and different households, it gets complicated, you know, it's like, well, if you're eating steak, I need to eat steak where it's like, now we got to afford two steaks, you know, <laughs> versus versus me and my wife having a steak, you know, kind of thing. And so, yeah, it's really complicated when you have different households and the family business is obviously complicated, but me and my wife very much, we have professional backgrounds. So we always operate very professionally, at least in, you know, on camera. <laughs> <laughs> What were those kind of early days like with the studio? Oh, man. So really, it was, like I said, I got the business of design from Dell. So I knew what I wanted, but it was scary. I'm not going to lie, right? But I knew that, you know, I had set myself up financially, thanks to Dell, that if I failed, I was going to fail quickly. And I was just going to go and work some at some other place. So I knew what I wanted. And so thankfully, I was aware that I couldn't do it all. So I had hired a friend of mine to help me develop the brand. I had hired a student of mine to just kind of basically be like the hands of things. I had really just put people in the right places so that way I can focus on the development of the business. Thankfully, my wife had already been doing books for her father's business and she's an accountant. Uh, That's her education in accounting. And so she does all things like money side. So she's thankfully was able to do all of that. So all I had to do was basically sell and do the work. And that's kind of what I'm really, really good at. And so it was scary at first, but we also were a smaller team. I think we were, I guess we were five at the time, but I just didn't know what it was going to be. But honestly, like, People have just, you know, trusted us and, and, you know, I hate to kind of keep hitting it over, you know, over the head with it, but I've never had a problem with kind of getting people to kind of follow us. So being able to sit down with somebody and tell them what we do and why we do it and why they should choose us wasn't difficult. What was difficult was disrupting the sign business, right? The sign industry. So we're designers who design signage, wayfinding and and physical experiences, Mm -hmm. but the problem with the sign industry is they're like the bastard child of construction. So what typically happens is a developer gives their general contractor a budget for signage. And so the general contractor is just trying to find somebody to stick some things up on the walls so that way they can get their certificate of occupancy. And so no one is ever talking about brand. No one's ever talking about experience. No one's talking about that. These sign shops some of them, not all of them, are just trying to basically pick a, put a piece of acrylic with ADA beads on and in whatever default typeface they can in the cheapest way possible. It's like it's like <laughs> a race to the bottom, right? It's like everyone's trying to be the Walmart of signs. And so I knew that I did not want to do that. And after listening to my father-in-law, who owned a sign company for like 20 years, and he owned Sign Tech International, which at a time was like one of the biggest manufacturers in Texas, you know, he was like, no, no, people, that's not how it works. We design it, we sell it, we mark up the price, and that's how we get paid. And I was like, so what happens when you design it and then they go and take it to somebody else and they get a lower bid? And he's like, well, that just happens. And I was like, no, it doesn't. Not here. (laughs) It's not going (laughs) to happen here. I was like, we're designers. We get paid to solve problems. We need to be paid or we're not going to do this. And he's like, you're not going to get people to pay for design before they see it. And I was like, well, then we're going to be out of business real quick. That was the weird thing is going into people who are used to basically, well, show me something and if I like it, I'll buy it. We're going to walk through this together. We're going to talk about your problems. We're going to talk about opportunities. You're going to pay me up front and then I'm going to show you what that is going to look like. And, you know, that's like I said, me and my father-in-law butted heads quite a bit. It was over that because he was like, oh, I've been working with this person for years. Like, we don't need to charge him for design. I was like, no, you're setting a precedent with everybody, right? If you do that. So we would butt heads. And that's when, you know, he was like, maybe this isn't good for us to be in business together. And that's when I was like, let's do it my way. My wife was already on board. And we now have, that's all we do, right? That's what we do. And people know us for that is that we solve our problems with design first. And then if you like what we design, 
and we're all done with the design process, right? We're going to give you a quote for fabrication and installation. But because you paid for that design process, you can take those files and share them with anybody else, right? You've already paid me for my work. This is now in your hands. So if you want to go out there and get a quote from somebody else, you can. No sweat off my back. I just keep it moving and go to the next project. But Mm -hmm. if they do go with us, then we'll fabricate. And we have partners all around the world that we fabricate with. And then we have partners uh, both locally and all around um, to install. And, you know, 90% still go with us. I would say more than that, 95% stay with us to do the fabrication installation process because we don't cut corners. And so they know that if we spec this particular material, we spec this particular lighting temperature or whatever, you know, that's what's going to be. It's not going to get in the hands of somebody else that then, you know, chops it up to, to make more profit and then, you know, gives them a subpar product. We don't do that. And so we have no problem getting people to commit through the whole entire process. But we put those breaks because some people have to get multiple bids. Some people, you know, think that they're not getting the best deal. And we tell people we will never be the cheapest, right? But we're the best. That's <laughs> what I say, you know, mm-hmm. we, uh, we do good work. That's our motto. Uh, we do good work for good people with good people. And so first and foremost is that, like I said, I don't work for anybody. I work with people. We call all of our clients partners because I pick and choose who I want to work with. If they're not a good person, we don't work with them. And there's been times where I've had to dig in on somebody just for a second, you know, like they call us up, they want to work with us. I Google everybody. And if I find anything that doesn't agree with our values, like I just say, hey, I don't think it's a good fit because we believe that everyone should be treated equitably, fairly, and that this world is unfair and we're not going to contribute to that in any way possible. We want to support all those, especially those who are not supported. We want to support the weirdos, the people who aren't typically accepted. And we want to support, obviously, our Black community, our underrepresented community. And so we do a lot to make sure that our good work extends beyond what actually earns us money. But also, we do a lot of work with uh, nonprofits, and we donate a lot of hours and times to people and organizations. And I have to say, you know, one of the best things about having your own business is running it exactly how you want it. Like if it's a bad client experience, you don't have to work with them. You can fire the client. Or if you have a certain intake process where you know exactly the kind of people you want to work with, like that's the best part. That was the best part back when I had my studio of of really picking and choosing the clients that you want to have, you know, knowing that just because any work comes across your desk, you don't have to take it if it doesn't feel good, you know? That's the freedom. And that's what I tell people is that, you know, I left Dell to have that freedom. And a lot of people think freelance comes with freedom. I said, there's nothing free about freelancing at all. You know, you <laughs> you have to decide, you know, do I want this money or do I not want this money? And for us, you know, we're not dollar driven. As long as we're able to pay all of our team members, you know, and pay ourselves a salary that we have dedicated Like, that's it. Like anything extra is great. And we really typically roll it back into the business one way or the other. But I don't want to have to say yes to every project and know that it's bad work, but it's paying the bills. And so, you know, I'm a firm believer that just like free work leads to more free work. Same thing with bad work, you know, crap work leads to more crap work. And so if it's not a right fit for us, the project's not a right fit. If the timeline, that's the biggest thing is some people just don't understand the process and the timeline. And if they don't want to adhere to our process and respect our process, that's a big red flag. So exactly being able to pick and choose who you work with is really the reward for owning the business. The rest of it still work. It doesn't matter where you go. It's work. Yeah. Know, it's not called fun. <laughs> <You know? laughs> but the best thing you can do, though, because you know it's still work is at least shape your own ideal work conditions, you know? Exactly, exactly. And that's the thing too, like I said about what I learned about Dell is I had a great creative director who taught us like the work-life balance. And I will say that Dell actually has a really good work-life balance throughout the entire company. So never did I feel like I had to be, I was, I was on the edge of burnout or anything like that. Like when it was weekends, no one called you. When it was holidays, no one called you. Like you didn't get woken up in the middle of the night and have to do this or that. So there was a really good work-life balance. So I knew I did not want to take that away from myself. And I didn't want to create an environment where my team felt that way. So we have like over, we offer 27 plus paid holidays to all of our team members. Um, wow. Doesn't matter if they're part-time or not. We just went through the holidays today or yesterday. 
they get two weeks off at the end of the year. I'm like, I'm paying them for two weeks. <laughs> but you know, we, it's, it's, we, we want them, you know, and, and that's on top of their PTO too. They get two weeks PTO on top of the 27 holidays and for us, and then they still have the, the get it done model. So if they want to travel somewhere and work three days and then be off for two days, then they only use two days PTO, you know? And so for us, you know, we really just want them to have a reason to be with us. Right. And that do good work motto is really what it's all about is that we want them to do good work, but we have to do good work by them and we have to treat them fairly. We have to give them a reasonable salary. I can't compete with, you know, the Googles and the apples and these people who are throwing stupid money at all these people. I can't compete with that. We're, we're a small business. Right. Mm -hmm. But what I can say is I can give you a work-life balance. That's fair treat you like a human being, you're going to speak with another human being, right? So I, I, you know, who's also a father, who's also a husband, who's also an educator, you know, who's going to understand what you're going through. And we're going to make a compromise. You know, if you got to take some days off, let's figure out what it's going to work. You know, if something's got to be moved around, let's figure out how to make it work, you know, so that way you can be efficient and we can be efficient. With studios though, I mean, of course, clearly you're doing a ton of great work, but you also do a lot of community work as well. And one organization that you work with is one that our listeners, I'm sure, know about. They're probably members of it. And that's uh, AAGD, which is African American Graphic Designers. Tell me about that. How'd you get involved with them? So (laughs) it's funny. So Owen Hammonds had kind of twisted my arm. So I'm a designer. I'm not an artist. And I make that very, very clear. Like I don't express myself through art or at least through design, right? I don't. I doodle, I do some things that to, to be creative, but I'm not an artist. But Owen kind of put me up to this challenge. They were doing a gallery thing at St. Ed's and he kind of said, hey, you know, Russ, I want you to participate. And, you know, like I said, he's a mentor of mine. So anything he asks me to do, I'm going to say yes. So he was like, you know, this is a self-portrait gallery and you have to basically draw or create an image of yourself. And it was like the worst project ever for me to have to do. Um, so in there, right, all the, you know, we're presenting our work at the end and it's a gallery opening and everything. And, um, Terrence Moline was also part of that gallery. And so I hear him talking and he's from new Orleans and he tells a little bit about his story and all that. I'm, like I said, I'm kind of a person who just says, I'm going to make this happen. I immediately looked at him and I was like, we're going to be friends, (laughs) right? I'm going to (laughs) make this man my friend. And so, I introduced myself and he told me a little bit about AGD. I think we followed each other on LinkedIn or on Facebook or something like that. And then we just kind of bumped into each other a little bit, you know, off and on. And I was really, really interested. And I I think I pinged him a couple of times about it and asked him about it. He had had the Facebook group for a couple of years. I think 2006 is when he started it, maybe. Katrina forced him to move to Austin. So he had had it for a while, but he it was just like a social thing, right? It was just a community-based thing that was more about sharing the work, but he he had visions of it being kind of a business model, but didn't really know where it was going to go. So I guess probably 2019, he really started doubling down on it being a business model and creating, you know, more benefits for its members in, in exchange for a membership fee. And so pandemic uh, hit early 2020 and I don't know how we kicked it off, but we just like, it. we hit the ground running, right? He was just like, hey, you've been really involved in AGD. Like with me, I'd love for you to, to, to kind of look over some of this stuff and just tell me like, what would you do? And I had been involved in AIGA quite a bit. I was a vice president, Owen Hammonds being the president at the time too, when I was vice president. I had kind of understood like Basically, AIGD is kind of like a black AIGA. So I understood what what was working for AIGA, also what wasn't working for AIGA, and what I saw could be an opportunity for AIGD. So we just kind of like together kind of just worked on how do we build this out to be a, a membership model. So another core member is Dave McClinton. And me and Dave met at that gallery too. Um, and I looked at Dave and I was like, we're going to be friends too. So Dave got really involved. So it was just kind of one of those things like these two gentlemen that I met one night and I said, I want to be friends with them. You know, fast forward a couple of years, you know, here we are. We meet every Tuesday. We joke around, we hang out. And it's just, you know, it's, a, it's an absolute honor to, to call these, you know, very, very talented, passionate creatives, you know, friends of mine. 
But then meeting all the people through AAGD that I've met, it's just amazing. It started out with just the need to create community for himself because transplant from New Orleans to Austin, not finding the black community that he had in New Orleans, wanting to find the, those he needed to find it online. Now to this international organization that the one thing that we have in common is that we're all black in, in some varying degree and that we are all creatives. And the creativity spans from film, digital, UX, UI, all across the board. And just as a design educator and as a person with my experience, you know, I am constantly sharing, you know, my knowledge about both the business of design and then also helping them empower them with you know, the confidence to charge more or to get contracts or to understand like this idea of freelancing sounds great, but you have to set goals or you're just going to work yourself to death. If you, you got to set a salary, you know, you got to tell yourself, this is how much money I want to make and then divide that up by 12 and then divide that up by a day and figure out how much money you got to make every single day to make that salary. So Mm -hmm. a lot of people don't understand that right off the bat when they're like, I want to be, you know, an entrepreneur. And then unfortunately too, you know, a lot of black creatives don't see themselves in the workspace. And so they think entrepreneurship is the only path for them yeah, because they've yeah. never seen anybody like them at a major creative agency. And so, you know, a lot of them have no understanding of the business of design because they've never worked at an agency. They've only done freelance. They've only done it their own way. So I try to meet them where they're at and share with them both my experience from Dell, but also my experience as, as an owner of Studio Zo, and just trying to tell them like, if you are finding these challenges, these are some of the solutions. So AGD has been you know, a great endeavor of, of Terrence's, and I'm just honored to be trusted with some of it. And so, you know, kind of bring it, you know, back to education. You know, we sort of alluded to this before we started recording the interview, but you've talked about being a design educator. You also now teach at where you learn design, which is at Austin Community College. So you've kind of had this this full circle moment. Like, talk to me about that. Yeah. So really, again, I'm no stranger to anything. My whole life has just been like this one long story of, you know, surely you're going to be a designer, but I have always taught in some capacity. So while I was freelancing back in like 2005, I needed additional income because freelancing wasn't doing it. And so I started working with an organization called No Kidding Straight Talk from Teen Parents, which was funded by the attorney general's office, which was a a nonprofit organization that basically utilized the stories of teen parents to use as a teaching tool for middle school and high school students. And so I technically didn't fall under the category of teen parent. I was 20 years old when my daughter was born, but we had a very unique story. My daughter needed, you know, lots of medical care. And so my story was unique in the sense of as much as you thought you had everything planned, like plan for the unexpected. And so I go to middle schools and high schools and give presentations and talk, you know, and that ended up putting me on national stage at the National Child Support Conference. So I've always had presentation and teaching opportunities. And then when I was, you know, while I was in school to supplement my income, I used to teach defensive driving. So I tell people, I tell people, if you can, can take a room full of people and for six hours and make them enjoy it, right? You can do anything, (laughs) right? So if I could, you know, because they don't even want to be there. They bought tickets to a show they don't even want to be at. But I, you know, I everything I do, I do 113%. That's my motto. And so no matter teaching defensive driving or talking to young people, I just pour my heart into it because I'm I'm just kind of one of those people that just, I can't half-ass anything. And so it was... It was just only uh, natural for me to kind of see myself as a design educator, but really what it was, and I attribute this 100%, was Owen Hammonds. To see another Black man teach and to be passionate and understanding at the same time, but also like pull no punches and really give it to you straight and push people to be the best designer they can be, he gave me that vision of like, I could do this. And so, you know, I made it my goal after starting at Dell. I said, in five years, I want to teach. Like that's my next rung. And it only took me three years later after saying that, that I started teaching. So I started teaching in 2015, I think, 2015. I'm like, man, we're coming up on seven years now. <laughs> Just, <laughs> I can't believe it. So yeah, 2015, um, I started teaching and I started teaching portfolio. 
I have been teaching portfolio for seven years. I started a new course because I was finding that my students had no knowledge, including myself. When I left school, right, when I graduated, I started at Dell. I never knew what a project manager did. I thought they were just like the 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 pretty people who sold our designs, right? I didn't know mm-hmm. what they did. And then when you get an amazing project manager who like has your back and is that buffer between you and the client and really helps elevate your design and keeps you on track, but keeps them focused and not, oh, I want to see this. I want to see that. And like when you have a really good project manager, it just changes your life as a designer. And so at Dell, I had the, the whole kit and caboodle. I had great project managers and I had terrible project managers at various times. So I was finding that my students were getting into portfolio, which is a, is a capstone class. So they, they graduate after my class with no knowledge that there were other roles other than designer and creative director. For some reason, they all know creative director, but they didn't know like <laughs> associate creative director, senior art director, art director, senior designer, junior designer, they didn't, production designer. They didn't know anything about those. Those roles didn't even pop up in their heads. So I had, you know, basically, you know, harassed my department chair that I'm um, like, these students have no idea the various areas of design that they could find themselves in. And a lot of the project managers, the best project managers I ever worked with all had degrees in design. They just didn't have either the passion or the skills to hack it, but they understood design, which makes a really great project manager. So along with Rachel Wyatt, a colleague of mine, we wrote this course called Studio, Design Studio. And basically it's a simulation course where students come in and they play the role of a project manager or an art director or a senior designer or creative director or something like that. They change roles throughout the course, but it gives them a real life experience. And then they have three projects over the course of that semester. And all those clients are real clients. Mm. So they have to deal with somebody not liking their work. It's not about the grade. It's about, did you solve the problem? Did you meet your client's expectations? And I remember the first time I taught that class was 2020. We wrote this course uh, during the pandemic and we delivered it in the fall of 2020. Uh, I had two teams, right? I have a uh, eight students and uh, two teams of four and one had it, their presentation buckled up and it was right and tight and they knocked their socks off. And then the other team, they just couldn't get their shit together. They presented and it was just falling apart and everything. And it was all over, you know, I meet with them one, you know, as the teams and I was like, you know, how are you feeling? And they're like, like shit, this this is an awful feeling. I was like, remember that. I was like, get your shit together, get it right and tight. When you're presenting in front of a client, right? This is the opportunity for you to sell your design. This is everything. You're building trust and all that. So this course is really doing what is designed to do is to give them that experience. So that way, when they go out and get their first job at an agency or at a studio, these roles, these requirements, these things that they're going to be asked of aren't foreign to them that they've like, oh, I presented my work. Because a lot of designers aren't forced to present and sell their work. They just hand it to a project manager or to a creative director, and they don't actually get to engage with the client and be able to talk about and articulate their design thinking. Instead, they're just like, do you like it or do you not? And so I explained to my students, like, you have to be able to sell your work. And so by the time they get to Portfolio, they're able to talk about their work in a much better way because of that studio class. Now we have studio one and studio two, which just is kind of a repeat, but just more, more responsibility and more expectations. What do your students teach you? Man, patience. (laughs) 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 But you know, honestly, like I tell them, you know, I get paid to learn from them. They teach me more than I could ever teach them. So what I've realized more than anything is that, we often only see life through our own lenses, right? And you ask me, you know, like, how did I get started in design? Did I know about design? And I didn't. To this day, I meet people in 2022, right, who they're the first person in their family to pursue a creative uh, career or a college, you know, uh, degree. And so I meet so many people from so many different backgrounds. I've had students as young as 19 and as old as 65. And What I've realized more than anything is that age, experience, life experience makes you a better designer. You can be these 30 under 30s or these, you know, these kids that are just like designing the heck out of stuff and are just killing it, you know, and these young guns. And I think that's what there's like a whole young guns thing or whatever. I can appreciate that. Right. But 
if you just haven't seen enough design solutions, if you just haven't been around the world enough, no matter how talented you are with the software, you just can't be a great design problem solver without that time. And you, you'll you get better every single day, but it's the people who are older and that sweet spot of like their late 20s, early 30s, early 40s, new callers, right? Who are going back to school that I'm starting to find out like, they have just enough life experience. They've seen just enough shit to say, I don't want it to be like that. But also I've learned I mean, quite a bit from them of just like the resilience. You know, I've had students who school was the only safe spot for them. When they went home, they had to deal with outside real world problems, whether it be addiction, whether it be, you know, homelessness, whether it be a number of things and school was a place for them. So it really taught me to, to kind of understand that we are all coming from different places, but we all have the same goal. And that is to be financially independent, hopefully, but to pursue a, a career in a very scary, scary realm, right? Where I tell my students, you have the greatest job in the world, right? We get to create something that never existed mm-hmm. and we get to solve problems, but it's scary to pick a career where it's like, I'm going to do something where every single day I'm going to be judged, judged by people who have no education in this, judged by (laughs) the masses. And that's scary as hell, you know, especially if you're an artist who's trying to pursue design. And I tell them like, what makes me feel comfortable as a designer and not an artist is that I can objectively defend all of my work and all of my design decisions. And that's kind of my uh, security blanket is that, as long as I know why we did this, as long as I know the problems that we're solving, like I can defend that all day long, but it's the subjective, right? It's the stuff that just, because I like it, because it feels good, because it's me, because of this stuff, you know, that's the stuff that's hard because it's just judgment, right? And you have to yeah. accept that somebody just doesn't like it. And so I try to help them kind of create a bigger gap between those things. And I said, if you don't want people judging your art, don't put your art into your design right? Leave that for the Mm. special people that you choose to share that with, but use your design as a tool and do your problem solving objectively. And then if you want to add a little bit of your spice on it, do that, but understand that they may not like it. That's a word. That's a word right there. That last part, I hope people caught that about if you don't want to be judged for your, your, what'd you say? Say that again. Judge for your art. Yeah. Yeah. I I think, I think that's the, the thing is designers. I mean, I don't know about you, but a lot of people get into design because someone told them you'll never make a career out of being an artist. And so they hear Mm. the word design and they think that, and so I got a lot of artists in front of my, in front of me every semester. And I'm like, separate your art from your design. So that way you can be a better designer and you don't have to worry about changing who you are as an artist. Something that I think I realized kind of early on with my studio was that a lot of designers design for other designers Mm -hmm. like they're not necessarily designing for the client they're designing because they want to be featured on brand new or under consideration or something like they're they're designing for awards they're designing for accolades for their peers when the client may hate it like i've seen oh god i remember especially in like the the like late 2000s there was so much design that was just the client hated it, but I did blank doing these kind of wild out of the box stuff. And yeah, if it doesn't, if it's not in service of the client and that's what the actual thing was for, like you're, yeah, it is arts that you're kind of trying to put out there and then you're putting this design sheen over it, you know, in that sort of way. But that's a word right there. The re- When I sort of, when that clicked for me, that's when like, honestly, the business and the work just became so much easier because it's like just design for what the client is looking for. It may not look the best, but then that client is going to keep hiring you and you're going to keep getting paid and your studio is going to stay in business. So you kind of have to like, it's a compromise in a way. I mean, I think once you get that relationship working, you can then sort of add a little something, you know, here and there, but it's tricky, but that's a a real word right there about judging. I think, I mean, you hit it on the head, you know, designers, especially in school, right? Start designing for the approval of their peers, right? And they want to get these awards. They want mm-hmm. to get recognized in the design community. And at what cost, right? At the cost of, like you said, the clients or the vision, right? Sometimes if you've ever had to do something like wedding invitations, right? Doing your own, own wedding invitations is the hardest damn thing. I went through like a whole existential, like <laughs> mental breakdown designing my own wedding invitations because I started designing them 
thinking about all my design friends that were going to be at the wedding, right? And what are they going to say when they get this in the mail? And you start really questioning yourself. And I had to like stop for a moment and just realize you're designing it for you and your wife on this moment and this day. This is what you're capturing. You're not trying to get the approval of somebody else, but you're exactly right. And the problem with that is, is that if you forget who's paying you, right? And it's not in that way of like, I'm going to do bad work because this person's writing me a check. Is are you solving their problems? If you don't, you're mm-hmm. not going to bat mm-hmm. for them and you're only going to bat for yourself, like then it's art and you're doing it only for you and it's selfish and you're asking them to pay you to do something that makes you feel good at a disservice to them. And so first and foremost, you have to serve. Like I tell people all the time, you know, design is a service, you know, just like waiting tables, just like, anything, we have a duty to serve them with the best solution possible. And sometimes it's telling them that they shouldn't have something, right? I give the analogy, uh, forgive me for the crude analogy, but it just works. You know, I tell people, if you owned a restaurant, right? And someone came to you and said, I want a shit sandwich, right? You wouldn't serve them a shit sandwich. Not because you don't make shit sandwiches. It's because that if they ate a shit sandwich and you know it's going to taste bad, they're going to tell all their friends that you served them a shit sandwich. And what people won't know is that they asked for that, right? So the same thing goes with design is that if your client asks you for something that you know isn't going to solve the problem, but you just give it to them, they're going to blame you for when that problem still is, is there and you just took their money. Where if you sit down with them and you say, hey, you know, let's go back real quick. Are you hungry? <laughs> Right. And they go, yeah, well, we serve a lot of other things, right? <laughs> Have you tried this? You know? And so I try to always reiterate to my students and my my team, you know, and to anybody that we as designers have a duty to serve our clients first and foremost and to solve their problems. And sometimes that means pushing back on them and some of the design decisions that they want. And then sometimes it's swallowing our own pride and realizing maybe this isn't what we want it to be, but it still does solve the problem and in a different way. When you look at where you're at now in life with the studio and everything, is this how you imagine your life would look like when you were a kid? No, it's way better. (laughs) It's, (laughs) It's way, I am making 13, 14, 15 year old Russell just I mean, I'm, I'm just killing it. Like 13 year old Russell is like, dude, who are you? Who are you? And I never would have saw this life for myself because I never saw it, to be honest. Right. I never, we grew up in a middle-class ish household, plagued with financial illiteracy and a lot of things that, you know, unfortunate that I never saw anybody doing the things that I do living the life that I live. So I couldn't even imagined it. And mm-hmm. so to look at where I'm at now, my nephew, I, today's, his, today's his 13th birthday. And I called him up and I said, you remember what I told you, right? When you were little, I said, what happens when you turn 13? And he, he goes, I get to go to Disney world. I said, yeah. And he's like, you remember that? I was like, yeah, you think I was just bullshitting? I was like, you know what, you know what I mean, right? You can talk about it, you can be about it. And he was like, I was like, yeah, I said, it's still pandemic right now. So we got to figure out a date when we all feel comfortable. I said, but yeah, you're going to Disney World. And the fact that I can do that, you know, for my nephew and the fact that I can take my daughter and my wife and, you know, we just went to Hawaii and I took my whole family, 10 of us to Hawaii and me and my wife, you know, we were, we were very appreciative of all the work that we have done and all the support of our family to be able to do this for them. You know, the life that I live now and the, the, the team that I have and the work that I've done and the amazing people that I've met and the opportunity to teach and the opportunity to get up every day and create something new, I could have never imagined it. And I am so very thankful. And I honestly attribute it all to design. Design literally saved my life and made my life. Like I said, in the very beginning, you know, going to school at ACC literally was the best decision I ever made. It set the trajectory of my life and set so many things in motion that had I never gone to ACC, had I not had the the people in front of me and had the mentors and the educators in front of me, I would have never gotten to where I'm at now. And so, yes, in short, no, I would have never been able to imagine this life. And yes, design, I give all of it to. Where do you see yourself in the next five years? Like, what kind of work 
Do you want to be doing either through the studio or personally or anything like that? I mean, I don't want to work, but, <laughs> but, <laughs> but you know, I, I have plans and, and hopefully I love teaching. I really do. I think that I'm a natural educator and a sharer of information and experience. And so I hope to continue teaching on a wider scale. I mentor a few people now, and I've toyed around with the idea of professionally mentoring and offering those services on a regular basis. Right now, my mentees, I feel weird taking money from them. So they just pay for my coffee. So I'm like, you know, now it's pandemic. So they just send me, they Venmo me money for coffee. <laughs> but <laughs> so, I think that I have a lot to, to, to share with uh, young professionals and, and budding uh, entrepreneurs and designers. I think that through a longer relationship, a mentor relationship that I can help really guide people who might feel like they haven't received the, the education and knowledge of the business of design and where to go and, and how to capitalize on opportunities. And then with the studio, as we were kind of talking about this kind of international work model, you know, me and my wife have uh, goals of, of finding a a place that's a little less uh, tumultuous for people of color. Where that place is on earth, I'm not quite sure. I don't think we found Wakanda yet. <laughs> <But> <laughs> you know, we don't know if the, the United States is necessarily our forever home, but, you know, our goal would be to really take our business global, honestly. So wherever we end up being, creating a, a team there, a local team there, that would continue to do the work that we are doing and then have our current studio ZO team basically lead that team. And so that would be less of a requirement of me and Elizabeth on our day to day. And then take this very seasoned team that has been with us for five years and turn them into leaders to guide maybe this international team to, to create the good work that we've been known to do. And so that's where I hope to see ourselves in five years is where I have, you know, five or six other people somewhere else in the world who zoom in with my team here and we're just cranking out the same good work, both night and day. One team's working while the other one's sleeping. <laughs> well, just to wrap things up here, where can our audience find out more information about you, about the studio, about your work? Where can they find that online? Well, you can always find us at studiozo.com, that's studio, D as in dog, Z as in zebra, O as in Oscar, the D is silent. And you can find us on Instagram, Studio Zo. You can follow me on Instagram, Russell Toins. That's Russell, two S's and two L's. Never trust a one L Russell. And <laughs> you can follow me on LinkedIn. Please, please, please check out agd.co and see all the good work that we're doing for our community there. And check out also Community College. Also, um, I know community colleges get a bad rap, but I have personally hired more designers from ACC than any other school, from UT, from Texas State, from St. Ed's. ACC, hands down, has the, a better design program, and the designers come out stronger. So um, if you're curious about that, if you're looking to change careers, ACC might be an opportunity for anybody who's local to the Austin area. Yeah, Russell Toynes, T O Y N E S. There's only a few a few of us out there, so if you just Google that last name, you'll you're sure to find me. All right, well, Russell Toynes, I want to thank you so much for for coming on the show. I mean, I've heard of you for years. I don't know if I mentioned I probably didn't mention that before we started recording, but I've heard about you for years, just like you were saying. My name has been kind of bandied about in the design community. I've heard about you for years. I was really excited to do this interview and really just kind of hearing your your story, hearing your passion for design and really even just your passion for just giving back to the community that has given so much to you is just super inspiring. So I hope people, when they listen to this, they really can kind of feel where your your passion comes from with this and also see how they can maybe pay it forward in their own communities as well. So thank you so much for coming on the show. I appreciate thank it. Thank you. I appreciate it, Maurice. Big thanks to Russell Toynes, and of course, thanks to you for listening. You can find out more about Russell and his work through the links in the show notes at revisionpath.com. Revision Path is brought to you by Lunch, a multidisciplinary creative studio in Atlanta, Georgia. This podcast is created, hosted, and produced by me, Maurice Cherry, with engineering and editing by RJ Basilio. 
Our intro voiceover is by Music Man Dre, with intro and outro music by Yellow Speaker. Transcripts provided by Brevity and Wit. So what did you think of the interview? Bernie, what do you think about the podcast overall? We'd love to hear from you, so please hit us up on Twitter or Instagram. You can just search for Revision Path, all one word, or leave us a five-star rating and review on Apple Podcasts, Amazon Music, or Spotify. The more people you tell about the show, the bigger we become and the further we can extend our reach to talk to black designers, developers, artists, and other digital creatives from all over the world. As always, thank you so much for listening, and we'll see you next time.